Coming up, I test out the V drive. I play some games. Jeff continues with the next. I chat to Alan and end with a classic joystick. Let's get on then. The Sinclair ZX Microdrive. A missed opportunity to set a decent standard for storage for the Spectrum right from the start. Delayed production and delivery meant that tapes took hold and there was no looking back. The unit was a great idea, a continuous loop of tape in a small form factor holding around 85k of data. As time would prove though, the felt pads on the cartridges would disintegrate and the heads would get covered in bits of dirt. It's still amazing though that something done that quickly and at that price still works today. Well, at least mine does. My drive and interface won't work fine, if I could get any cartridges that is. Well, we're in the future now though, so how about keeping the aesthetic, the interface and the microdrive, but replacing the innards with something more modern and reliable? Here is the V-Drive. This was featured in one of my magazines a few issues ago and reviewed by a guest reviewer, as I didn't have one at the time. Now though, I do. So let's start from the beginning. The V-Drive is a modern replacement for the microdrive. It uses all the same ROM commands and is fully compatible. It fits inside the original casing and needs Interface 1 to operate. If you have a broken microdrive, great. If you haven't, maybe try and buy one cheaply, or just swap out the mechanics anyway. A point worth mentioning, you can damage some parts doing this, so please don't use this as a guide. I'm doing this on my own hardware. This is not a tutorial. First we need to do the most difficult part, and that's removing the metal faceplate from the microdrive. We need to get this off because the screws that hold the case together are underneath. Now this metal is thin and can easily be bent or damaged, and it's suggested by the supplier that you use a hairdryer to soften the double-sided tape, before trying gently to pry it off the top. Mine seemed a bit loose, so without using a hairdryer, and using a bit of gentle persuasion, it came away fairly easily. There are a few dents in it, but I'm quite pleased with the result. Now we can remove the two screws from the top, and the one screw from the bottom. Next, you lift off the top casing, be careful not to break the clip on the back. Push out the LED, I used a cloth to do this so it wouldn't break. And there are two more screws inside that hold the circuit board in place, and then the whole thing can be lifted out. Right, that's the hard bit over. Next, you put a supplied washer onto the case, put the V-Drive lower part onto the case, and screw it back down. You place the top SD holder in, put the clip and the LED back, and reassemble. At this point I didn't want to screw it back together or refix the faceplate until I'd tested it. Luckily it tested fine, so it all went back together and it looked great. I must say, it's really nice to see my Speccy with a microdrive connected again. The unit can be used alongside standard microdrives too, if you really wanted to, but for now I'll just stick with this one. The V-Drive runs off SD card. I had a few ones lying about, so I got a 2GB card and a few MDR files on it. MDR files are standard microdrive emulation files that can be found on the usual Spectrum websites. I then read the instructions, which tells me I shouldn't really do that before prepping the card with the built-in toolkit. To do this, you remove the SD card and enter the run command. This loads the toolkit from the V-Drive itself. When that's done, we have extra basic functions to use. So to initialize the card, we put the card back in and enter .sd init to set up the card for use. This can take a few seconds per gigabyte of card, so be patient. Once done, we can put it back into the PC if we want and add files and folders, or we can use the toolkit commands to do it. Let's create a directory called Sinclair then. You use the mkdir command to create a folder. You can view it by typing .ls. To go into the folder, we use the .cd command. And now let's create a blank microdrive image. You do this using the .mkimg command and the name of the cartridge. Now we have that, we can actually assign it to the virtual drive using the .ld command. With that done, it's time to format it. You can use the normal Sinclair commands or the shortened vdrive commands if you want. 
The speed is slightly slower than a normal microdrive, so don't expect things to be lightning fast like a DivMMC for example. This is a virtual microdrive and operates as such. Ah, those familiar black lines. With the image loaded and formatted, we can now cut it. We can write a simple basic program and save it out. Check that it's there and load it back in. All very easy and just like the real thing. There are other options too. You can define banks. Banks hold data on image files that can be preloaded into predefined virtual drives. For example, you could have a bank named Tools and in that bank you can have one image with TaskWord on, one image with SuperDrive Tools on and one image with a blank cartridge in. If you issue the command .sd and the bank name, that will automatically load all the images into the virtual drives for you. You can do this via the toolkit on the real spectrum, or you can do it by editing the config file on your PC. As an example, here's a config file I set up. Banks are named in square brackets. The setup bank is something the vDrive uses and should not be changed. It holds the last bank that you've set. As you can see, I have a bank called Sinclair, in which are three virtual drives pointing to MDR files in the folder. So I have a folder off the root called Sinclair, and in that are three files, demo.mdr, bus.mdr, and ant.mdr. If I load this bank into the vDrive using the sb command, I have a virtual drive with the demo cart in drive 1, the ant attack cartridge in drive 2, and the business cartridge in drive 3. You need to keep in mind some programs assume they are running from drive 1 though. Some like Taskword do allow you to select the drive before saving. OK, maybe that seems a little bit over the top, but very powerful once you get to grips with it. The best thing is, any programs that use the microdrive, such as Taskword, will work just fine. You can ignore all this and choose to manually assign an image to a drive when you need them. This is done using the .ld command. Sometimes this can be quicker, rather than trying to figure out which banks hold which images. Let's load the demo cart into drive 1 then. Navigate to the folder where the image is and issue the command. And that's done. Now let's take a trip down memory lane. The V drive doesn't emulate the sound of the Mac drive, which is a bit of a shame really. It does beep when reading and writing, but this can be turned off if you don't like it. There were very few software titles released on the Mac drive, and only one game, Ant Attack. There are several ways to get games onto cartridges though. First you can use a multiface, and it works perfectly. You set it all up, load the game of choice, press the button, and save it out to microdrive, just like you did in the old days. The only problem with that is you have to load things through a cassette. The other option is to use the brilliant Z80 on MDR program written by Tom Dolby. Just like his other tool that puts games onto disk images that you saw in episode 101, this tool allows you to take Z80 files and load them onto an MDR image. This tool also creates a nice little menu when done. Once you've run that on the PC, you copy the MDR file across to the SD card, put it in the V drive, load the image into drive 1, reset the spectrum and issue the run command. And now we have a nice little menu to choose from the games we've already put on there. Again I have to stress, this is emulating the micro drive and it loads just a little bit slower than the real thing, so this isn't for people who want instant loading. And one last thing, how about this then? A graphic desktop for the spectrum and micro drive. It's called Max Desktop and was released in 1987 by Advanced Memory Systems. It has all the usual functions. You can view files, view the cartridge, view sectors, rename things, format, delete, run. Obviously it's better with a mouse, but it works fine with a keyboard. And a glimpse into the future then, of the things that are coming to the home micro soon. This is a great piece of hardware if you want to keep that Sinclair look. It works well, and the extra commands are useful. From microdrive lovers everywhere, this should definitely be on your shopping list. As we're talking about the ZX Microdrive, let's take a look at the only game to be released on it. Ant Attack from Quicksilver, released in 1983. Ant Attack shouldn't need any introduction. It was a spectacular game when it was released, and the graphics were just amazing at the time. The game came as part of Sinclair's expansion kit that included Interface 1, a microdrive, a blank microdrive cartridge, a cartridge for business, and a cartridge with games. The other item on that cartridge was Games Designer, also from Quicksilver. The game sees you playing a hero, either male or female, 
out to rescue your beloved partner from the ant-infested city. The map for the city was published in Yor Sinclair, and it's very impressive. Each building has its own name, and you can tell the author, Sandy White, was interested in architecture. The first thing to hit you is the graphics. 3D scrolling landscape, it was just amazing when you first saw this. You can also view the proceedings from four different angles, switching instantly, and this is needed for some locations that allow you to locate the other person, because they may be out of sight. You can run and jump, again very much needed, and you also have a number of grenades, and you can use this to get rid of some of the ants. Be careful though, you can blow yourself up. Grenades can be thrown four different distances using four different keys, so you'll need to get used to that. As you run around, a small box at the bottom of the screen will turn red or green, depending on if you're heading in the right direction or not. Using this, you first have to locate the person, and then get to them, as they're sometimes placed high up on buildings, and then take them back to the exit. As you move around, the ants start to give chase, and you have to use the buildings to outfox them by either going inside and coming out the other end, or just manoeuvring so they get stuck on a wall. Or you can just find a high point and throw a grenade at them. You have a limited number of grenades, but there is an ammo box hidden in the desert outside the city walls. You also have a limited amount of time, but it's generous enough not to be intrusive. Once you find the person, then they start to follow you. They can sometimes get stuck on the walls as well, so you have to circle back round to pick them up, all the time being chased by ants. The people you have to rescue are placed at semi-random locations, in that there are a number of locations per level where they can be. It's a great feeling heading towards the exit, having rescued a person with a mass of ants chasing you, and the exit is just there. As you progress through the 10 missions, the locations get harder to climb, and further away from the exit, so it's definitely a challenging game. Control is good once you get used to the keys, and gameplay is brilliant. Sound is minimal, but does a good job of conveying what's going on. This was one of the first games I completed, mainly due to the competition in your Spectrum magazine. I played it and played it, even taking pictures of the final screen, because there was to be some questions in two national newspapers, The Guardian and The Daily Telegraph, and a massive amount of Spectrum stuff was given away to the lucky winner, and yes, it was huge. There was full of keyboard, a microdrive, trick stick, ZX printer, joystick, and tons of games. You had to answer two questions. First, the four possible locations of the last person on level 10, plus the question in the newspaper. Sadly, the article was only published in one of the two newspapers, and it was the one that I didn't buy. And the question I didn't really know the answer to anyway at the time, and it was, what can be found in the desert outside the city walls? And the answer, of course, is another box of ammo. A great game then, and I'm sure everyone must have played it by now. If not, you really need to play it. What a fantastic game. After Ant Attack, Sandy White wrote Zombie Zombie, and after that, this game, Eye of the Mask, released by Electric Dreams in 1985. Continuing with the excellent 3D routines, he opted to move to a new viewpoint, but more on that later. The story then, we control our hero equipped with a pack jet suit and laser. The challenge is to compete a trial that involves locating crystals, and there are three crystals in each of the 32 universes, once located, you shoot them, and one of three things will happen. Either you'll be transported to a new universe, where it all starts again, or you'll be transported to another location in the same universe, or a component of the robot will be revealed. To complete the game, you have to complete the robot, which is shown to us at the start of the game. Yes, it's a huge game too, and if that wasn't difficult enough, the robot parts have to be collected in the right order. to the game then, and it's an impressive 3D first person style game. You run about the maze, as you're moving and you want to turn, you just make sure that you're at the right side, so if you want to turn right, you head over to the right side of the tunnel. Once you get used to it, it's fairly easy to navigate. You 
can run back, in which case your character then runs towards you, which is a bit tricky, but it won't take long for you to get used to it. On the small map we can see markers, and heading for these will take you into space on a scooter where there are three crystals. Shooting one will trigger one of the events mentioned, and if you get a robot part you have to shoot that three times before you can grab it. The top crystal will take you to another universe, the bottom right crystal will take you to another part of the same maze, and the bottom left crystal will take you to one of the robot parts. When you do find one you have to shoot it three times as mentioned before, and this also boosts your energy, something not mentioned in the manual. However, you can only collect the part if it's the next one in order. The targeting system seems to be a bit off, which causes a lot of frustration. When you're trying to shoot a robot part, you can easily waste all of your ammo and only hit it once or twice, which then leaves you without any ammo to continue the game. The manual hints at how to get extra ammo, but I have yet to find out how. Using the infinite ammo poke made it slightly less annoying. If you take a wrong turn, the mask appears, for reasons that are not clear, but it does look very nice. There is a map on screen, which sort of helps you hitting dead ends, but the many games I played I quickly ran out of power, until I found out that shooting the robot parts gave you more. You can view a larger map of the game by pressing the pause button. The sound is, shall we say, interesting. It suits the game, but not quite sure what it is trying to convey. I think limiting the power was a bit harsh, especially when you're not told how to replenish it. But once you know how the game works, how to get extra energy, and how to use the portals, I think you'll start enjoying it. I certainly did. It's a massive task to complete it, and in my case I never actually got a robot part. But I was really starting to get into the game. It's worth playing just to see the 3D effect, but you need to invest a little bit of time in it, otherwise you'll be disappointed by the short games when you get lost in the maze or can't find any of the crystals. This is Transylvanian Castle, released by Fitosoft in 2020. This is a dungeon crawl game, very much like the Oracle's Cave, if you can remember that. You have to work your way through the rooms in search of Dracula. On the way you will have to fight a variety of beasts, collect treasure and weapons, and hopefully survive long enough to complete the game. Moving and attacking is done with the same key, and you are told if something is blocking your way. As you fight, your energy goes down, and you need to find food to replenish this. When you find a weapon, you can place it in one of your hands, ready to use. The graphics are okay for this style of game, and the info screen helps you work out the best route. Because you can't collect anything in the rooms until any monsters are defeated, you can often find yourself low on energy and no way to go, so the game ends, and you will try again with the random rooms and monsters. Overall, I enjoyed this game. It was something different, and set at a nice pace. I think there needed to be a rest option to regain some energy, or maybe a fountain at the start or something where you can replenish it, rather than just keep on dying. If you like this style of game, certainly give it a try. So let's talk a bit about AGDX Mini then, which is a, an offshoot of AGDX with um, quite a few differences. Obviously the main difference is that the sprites are now 8 pixel square, so you're using UDG size graphics for that. 
So why? <laughs> I'm not saying that in a facetious way because I, I'm just wondering where the idea came from because it's... Yeah, so why would you want to have smaller, crappier sprites than the ones that... Sure, well, well, I've got one word for you, Robotron. How's that? I mean, that's a game with very tiny sprites and it's fantastic, isn't it? So that's an explanation in itself, really. Um, so, so did you build it with, it with a game in mind or did you just build it because of... Well, because it needed doing... Well, I mean, most of the stuff, pr- pretty much everything that I do is based on the idea that I think, well, that would be, be an interesting challenge and it will teach me something, you know. I had a couple of ideas and I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to have more sprites? Yeah, because the, the RGD is limited to is it eight on screen at once, isn't it, the standard version? Yeah, I think it's 12 actually, but I thought it would be interesting to try something a bit different, optimise the code, especially for drawing with 8x8 eight eight characters, it meant that we could cut out a fair amount of the, the memory that's used by the, the sprites and uh, and limit it, but at the same time optimise it. So the the 8x8 eight eight sprites, they only take up a quarter of the size of AGD sprites, let's say, the regular ones. But I've made them twice as big because then there's less calculations. So the whole thing is the whole thing is designed to be optimized for the maximum speed, let's say, and so that for that reason it can handle about I think well I've set it for forty sprites, but it, it can handle about thirty, thirty two, let's say, fairly well. Well, well, you tell me. I mean, I know you've written a game with it now, haven't you? So I have. Um, I wasn't actually looking to push the number of sprites. I was just. It started out. I was interested to see what a game would look like using small sprites and would it you know would it look like a typing game would it would it look better because obviously you've got um, the smooth movement of, of normal sprites just in a, a smaller form factor and um, so I didn't look to push it uh, I did I think in one room with the space invaders I think there was about I don't know maybe 15 sprites in there something like that uh, and there was no problems at all it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I totally get what you're saying there about the um, the typing games and the and the small. Because there are there are these games. I know you and I both have a have an interest in these sort of very early '80s spectrum games. You know, perhaps it's just the age that we were. Or it's interesting because you got this. You, you kind of know that all this, this great stuff is going to come, but it's it's the real bedroom coder era, isn't it? That sort of '82, '83 period. So that's and for me that has an appeal. So. And you look at some of the games that people make, and you, and you kind of think, well, you know what? That's not a bad game. If it was smoother, if it was faster, if it wasn't so jerky. There are. There are I mean, mixed in with all the, the dross like uh, bomber games and things like that, there are some really good ideas for games. It's just that, obviously, people didn't have the skills then to do that. And using user-definable graphics and basic, you're not really going to get smooth gameplay, are you? Yeah. So you could say that was another reason. It's the idea of taking that those sort of UDG concepts and, and making them into something a little bit smoother and faster. But it definitely doesn't, you know, it's a, it, it's all about, you know, having a fun experience, isn't it? I mean, if you think of a game like, say, um, Super Meat Boy, right? That was a, another, that's a fairly recent game, let's say, in the context of, of our conversation. And that has very small sprites. And there are quite a few what you would call modern retro games that have uh, very small sprites. Because the other thing that it does, of course, and this I think is another big factor, is it just gives you a lot more space on the screen to to move. So perhaps that was a that was a you probably found that in the game when you were making it. You were like, well, actually, we can have two different levels of of, of play area here. Hello. A couple of episodes ago, we looked at basic programming resources for the Spectrum Next. This time, we're going to look at Z80 assembler resources. There are many Z80 resources available on the internet. Today, I'm going to only look at a few of them, but some really, really good ones. First, it's Daryl again. Yes, Daryl Sloan in May 2017 put together a series of four tutorials titled A New ZX Spectrum is Coming, Time to Learn Z80 Machine Code. 
as with Daryl's basic tutorials, these are really, really well done. And if you're completely new to Z80 coding, these are a really good place to start. In the tutorials, Daryl uses the Z80 editor and assembler, which is built into the ZX Spin emulator. I would really recommend that as a good place to start. The next resource is the Chibi Akamas website and YouTube channel. If you want to learn how to program in Z80 Assembler, or many other forms of Assembler, Chibi Akamas should be your first port of call. Keith, who runs the site, has put together a series of tutorials that far surpass anything else I've found on the net. Under his Z80 section, he has generic Z80 tutorials, and those aim specifically at the Spectrum and the Spectrum Next. As with BASIC, everything you can do on a Spectrum, you can do on a Next, but the Next has a lot more on top of the original Spectrum that can be done in Z80 Assembler. Keith has also written a book, which I have, and can highly recommend to anyone wanting to get started on Assembler programming. It isn't too detailed, and you can't learn Z80 Assembler just from the book. It's more of a supplement to the online resources and tutorials that Keith's put together but it's still well worth getting in a really good read. Keith explains things in really, really good detail, and he makes loads of resources available to you. With Z80, he does use a Amstrad CPC emulator with its built-in Z80 editor and assembler. What I did while I was going through Keith's tutorials was use ZX Spin to start with, so that I knew that what I was doing would work on the Spectrum. And Keith has pretty much taught me everything that I know about Z80 Assembler, enough to even create a quite a small and modest game. The most amazing thing about the whole thing is Keith's tutorials aren't even just for the Z80. The next resource that I think is worth looking at is Retrocorder TV. In particular, Retrocorder TV has a tutorial on setting up Visual Studio Code as a next Z80 Assembler environment using SJSM Plus. C-Spect and various Visual Studio Code plugins. I did that myself before I'd watched this tutorial and I agree with his opening comment that it takes quite a while to sort out. One comment I would make is if you watch the tutorial the reason that his main.next file doesn't get into the image file is that the file is missing from the end of the HDF monkey command. I put a comment on the tutorial to that effect. Retrocoder TV has many other tutorials and they're worth watching for a different perspective on how to code Z80 for the Spectrum Next. Then, of course, there are Jim Bagley series of tutorials, which, as well as going over how to program in BASIC on the Next, they also cover how to program Z80. As I said when I covered BASIC, these are a great series of tutorials and Jim does a really good job of explaining things. He takes everything at a really good pace. Although I must admit, having known BASIC and Z80 a little bit myself, sometimes it is a little slow. Jim does a great job of explaining things and comments the code really, really well, as he goes. While these tutorials were live, I'm sure there'll be people watching them for years and years to come. The next resource is the Spectrum Next website and wiki. This is an invaluable resource for anyone programming Z80 Assembler for the Spectrum Next. There are many articles on the Spectrum Next site, often which point to the right wiki pages for more in-depth information. In particular, the article ZX Spectrum Next I.O. Port Systems and Registers is invaluable. Another resource that I've recently come across is Lucky Red Fish. I've only recently found this, but it looks like a really useful resource for anyone programming Z80. At the time of recording, it's the only site I've found that explains how the next DMA works, though I still haven't figured it out yet. So that's said 80 resources on the internet for helping you program on the Spectrum Next. There are many, many others. I didn't have time to go into all of them here. And as always, if you're looking for something in particular, Google is your friend. If I were to recommend just one, it would be... Keith's Chibiacomus site, tutorials and book, closely followed by Jim Bagley's tutorials. The Conic Speed King, an iconic joystick, and a joystick I used heavily as an Amiga owner. However, I have never been a joystick user for the Spectrum. 
I found them too cumbersome and much preferred the keyboard. A recent trip to Lee's Games in Markham saw me coming back home with this joystick, thanks to a kind donation. Before I test it out though, a bit of history. Joysticks were dull, a flat, square bit of plastic with a handle sticking out, sometimes with a fire button, sometimes with two. The shapes may have varied slightly, but they were pretty much all the same. Cheetah tried to break the mould with the rat, an infrared joystick that was, to be honest, a bit poor. The trick stick also tried to break away from this normal shape, but again, it never really made it. Then in 1985, Connix came up with the Speed King. It looked amazing, despite early adverts not having the full stickers or colouring. It was rounded to fit in the hand. It had a single fire button exactly where your index finger was, and it had high quality micro switches on the small but easy to use stick. It felt good in the hand. It was comfortable, if you were right handed of course, and that satisfying click when you move things was a great sound. Now back to my little experiment. As a keyboard gamer, I wanted to see if the Speed King provided any better gameplay than a normal joystick for the time, in this case the Cheetah 125 Plus. First, the bad points about the Cheetah 125 Plus and joysticks in general that put me off them. First, they usually had suction cups underneath that came loose during gameplay and caused all sorts of problems. Secondly, because of the shape, they were very uncomfortable to hold in your hand. Thirdly, the leaf switches used for the vast majority were fragile and easily broken. And fourth, the leaf switches didn't give enough feedback when you were playing a game, so you didn't know if you had moved or not, and this often caused overcompensation when moving, which in turn broke the micro switches. All of this really put me off using one on the Spectrum back in the day, not only the 125, but any other joysticks of similar design. Now the Speed King overcomes all of these negatives. I set up my 48k Specky, loaded a few games and tested out the three options of playing. The keyboard, the Cheetah 125 and the Speed King. I still found the Cheetah annoying, but to be honest not as bad as I remember. The leaf switches were bad though, maybe a sign of old age, but they were just not enough to provide a positive feedback when moving about. I tried a variety of games, Galaxians for left right fire gaming, Attic Attack for far directional movement, and Jetpack for a slightly different style. I of course tried a few more as well. During all these games the control felt sticky and unresponsive. Moving on to the Speed King then, and this felt totally different. More responsive, that clicking sound and good quality micro switches provided good feedback. Galaxians was great and more accurate. Attic Attack felt much more responsive too. And even Jetpack worked well, a game that I always struggled to play with joysticks. It was better than the Cheetah, definitely, at least for me. The game seemed easier to control, and the control itself was more precise. It was more comfortable to use as well, and I felt that I could use it longer than the Cheetah. That, after a while, started to hurt my hands as I tried to hold it down on the desk. The only bad thing I could find about the speaking was if a game needed more than one fire button, for example Ikari Warriors, holding the joystick meant you didn't have a free hand to do it, so you couldn't throw grenades, for example. But with the Cheetah, well, if it stuck to the desk, at least it gave you a free hand. Will all this turn me to using joysticks? Definitely not. I still prefer the keyboard for the Spectrum, but the Speed King is a great joystick, and if anything it has brought back many memories of Amiga gaming, where this was probably the most used stick I had, at least until the Navigator was released anyway, or the shop ran out of RAM deltas. 